Uh, so welcome, um, Lorraine and Linda. My name is Darcy, and I'm excited to be the navigator for uh, Linda's, Linda's new aspiring mentorship group, which starts Wednesday, February 28th at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. If you're new to Mastrius, it's a wonderful opportunity to receive mentorship from a professional or master artist such as Linda to assist you in learning and growing your art practice. Groups are supportive and non-competitive, where, where growing artists receive monthly mentorship from their choice of mentor. Each group is a maximum of only eight people, so the learning is quite personalized, and then weekly events are open to the whole Mastrius community. Mastrius is all about connecting, so do feel free to ask questions during today's demo, or if you're more comfortable typing them in, feel free to do so in the chat box, and I'm happy to read them out. Today, we have the distinct pleasure of engaging with Linda Reisenberg Fissler, a woman with a wide range of talents. Linda is an artist, an author, and a mentor. She has taught at the Middletown Art Center in Ohio and conducted online mentor classes. She also writes, produces, and directs an internet radio TV show called Art Chat TV, on which she has interviewed many of today's master artists. In the winter of 2023, Linda launched a bi-monthly painting instruction show called Chat, Create, and Cocktails. Both this online show and her podcast attract an international following. Art Chat TV is ranked in the top 50% of podcasts available worldwide. Linda worked for and was mentored by Kevin McPherson, Carolyn Anderson, and George Gallo. Her work is created using palette knives from start to finish, even the blending to create soft edges. Linda is also an accomplished author. The Artist Magazine and F Plus W Media's marketing books have featured four of her articles on art business advice. She has also published several art instruction eBooks. In 2015, she self-published her first fiction book, Blind Influence, which won three book festival awards at both international and domestic festivals. The Blind series consists of five books. The fifth, Dagger, was published in the summer of 2023. She is currently converting the fifth five book series to scripts for consideration as a streaming series. Linda is also writing book six, Blind Dominion, and a fantasy series. I think that's just fascinating. <laughs> Linda cycles and hikes in the Blue Ridge Mountains and around Western North Carolina. These activities provide Linda with the spark to create. She studies and captures nature as it is and is hoping that climate change does not rob future generations of the beauty she enjoys today. I'm really looking forward to being a part of Linda's mentorship group and welcome you to consider joining as well. Today, Linda is going to demonstrate painting with palette knives while discussing her painting process and the experience that led her to paint with palette knives. She indicated on the write-up that there is a story every step along the way, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of those stories today. I'll pass it on to you now, Linda. Oh, thank you, Darcy. That was quite an introduction. I appreciate that. Um, Linda, is it possible to get the microphone closer to you? Because you're a little muffled. Oh, you know what? I may not have. Hold on one second. I may not have switched the microphone. Hold on. Oh, okay. Yeah. It sounds like you're far away. Yeah, I only did the headphones. I'm there sorry. You go. No, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Let's perfect. see. Here's microphone. Is that better? Much better. Yeah. Okay. All good. Yeah, it was over by my desk, which wasn't probably very helpful <laughs> at all. So sorry about that. Told you guys you'd laugh. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is where we're going to be starting. Um, I did a quick sketch of a photo that I took. And Darcy, you're going to have to, I didn't switch my, let me turn. No, my it's all good. It's all yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So if I'm, if I'm not on car, uh, camera, please tell me. So um, cause I didn't put through my, or turn my monitor around to look at it. Once I get going on this, I won't need to look at it. So, so this is the photograph I took in a black and white and I apologize for the reddish color to it. I have a, a, um, a printer that's dying so <laughs> very slowly. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to focus on this person here. That's my first focal point. And then if you look at these rocks, how that it's just, compositionally, it's just really a nice photo um, that I want to turn into a painting. So if you look at this rock, it leads us into her. And then directly another line back, we have this nice dark area here. Okay. So what I want to do, or what I did, I should say, is sketched what I wanted onto this. So you can see 
a lot of the painting like over here, I just kind of moved in. So I did a lot of editing with the photograph so that I could come with a very nice sketch of what I want to happen. And um, what I'm thinking about doing here is I wanna walk you through what I'm thinking process-wise for setting up this particular painting. And by the way, the reason why I wear gloves, I am an oil painter, but as long as I don't get the oil paint in my mouth, I should be okay, but I have nails. Um, I have my nails done. And sometimes paints get down in that little crevice. So that's why I wear gloves. Um, I don't like having that paint down there because it can get absorbed into your skin and you just wanna be safe. It's, um, oil paints can be a little bit uh, daunting at times and um, might be scary, but if you take the right precautions, you'll be great. As, as my friend, Michael Harding, whose paints I use said to me one time, as long as you eat it, as long as you don't eat it, you're gonna be okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> and he makes stack lead white. So if anybody remembers the old stack lead white, um, you know, it, it's very, very toxic to your liver. So he's, he was funny when he was saying that to me, because I kept looking at him when he kept saying st stack lead white. And I'm like, I'm not so sure I want to get into that, but it's a, it's a lovely, it's great for building texture into a painting. It's, it's just wonderful. So with the, the canvas that we have here, um, and, and think about how you want the viewer to walk through your painting. So literally we read kind of left to right. Uh, people over in the Middle East in that area, they read right to left. So I wanna make sure that this particular painting is set up so that it, you can enter and get to her rather quickly. So here we have this nice area with these rocks again, pointing directly towards her. And this side, a little bit further down, I have this path coming in on the right. And then very calm, watery area that just allows your eyes to work upward, okay? And then from here, it's a matter of designing bushes and rocks and tree trunks and limbs that will bring you back down towards this center and then back down towards her with some nice color in here that will direct your eye back to this particular spot. So the first thing I did, you may see two lines running down this way and two lines running across this way. That's the rule of thirds that I always start with. And what I do is I take the focal point of what I want the, the viewer to look at and place that on one of these four points. It's very close to where if you use the golden mean, the four focused areas, of where you would want to put something so that the eye will rest and take a look at and really start working into um, becoming a part of the painting, feeling like you're standing there or you're you know off in the background watching the girl play in the water or whatever. But um, yeah, so that's how I usually start. Um, I don't typically sketch, uh, but I decided to do this because I was too sketch because I would be talking to you all about my thinking process and I wanted something to help guide me. So if I if you look at the photograph, like I said, you could tell I moved things over, but if you look here, like this tree trunk log here and this one, you have to be very careful with tree trunks because if you, they're stop signs and mm -hmm. they're also ways out of the painting. So when I was looking at this, I was really concerned about this tree trunk and I thought to myself, maybe I just won't put it in, but it's actually very helpful, at least in the photograph, because you come up and then there's this nice foliage going on here, which we'll make with very soft edges so that it's a doorway back to this rock over here. And then these trees that are down here, which probably don't look like trees to you guys, probably just look like a very dark area, but there's some pine trees here that we can direct the branches down this way, which brings us back to the stream and the rocks. So all of those, things, yeah. So all of those things you have to take into consideration. So and I and as I told Darcy before uh, folks got here, um, once I get to this stage, this reference photo is there to help tell me about where the light is. So again, if you look at this side, and this isn't because of my printer, light is coming from this direction. Okay. And you can tell that is true here. Look at this dark value here. 
lighter value here, a medium value there. So you could tell exactly where the light is coming from. So it's coming from the left and then all of the trees providing different shaded areas for it to look at. And that's important to determine um, before you start putting any kind of paint down, um, whether it be a value study, which is what we're gonna start with today, or jump right in with colors, you know, that first, that first color note, that first bit of paint that you put on a canvas is, you know, so important and can set the tone for um, how confidently you're gonna start painting. With oil paints, you wanna paint dark to light. So your darkest values to your lightest values. What you'll see when I start painting is that I kind of jump around and that's only because I, while I'm sketching, while I'm doing this value study, in my mind, I'm already thinking about what color, how warm it's gonna be, uh, what value level it's gonna be at, et cetera, et cetera. So we get down to finding our darkest dark and our lightest light. And then if you study past masters you'll and look at their work in black and white, you'll see that they limit their number of values, but they, uh, it, they the amount of color within a value or the, is just fabulous. So as um, Kevin used to tell me all the time when I was trying to learn Kevin McPherson, we have 10 values, but we have millions of colors. And inside each value can live a number of different colors. So that's one of the things that I've always focused on and you know, trying to expand my palette, trying to mix a, a number of different colors within a certain range of value. Don't know if that makes sense, but <laughs> there we are. So I'm just gonna show you real quick. This is the palette knife that I use to mix, probably no different than anybody else's. But these are the palette knives that I use most often and you can tell because they're all full of color <laughs> from me grabbing them and painting with them. So I can get a, a number of different shapes on these guys using these. And then I have two other sets of uh, knives that I don't really use that often. Um, I'll just pick up a couple here. And, and I'm trying to work them in to my routine, but they have some really weird shapes to them. This guy's really nice, but he does a nice fine edge. Um, this particular, these particular sets have really strange edges to them and I'm kind of experimenting with what they can do. So I really haven't accomplished them or included them in my, my painting thing. This one is very helpful because it helps you set straight lines. Mm. So um, the wider and the longer, the bigger you can get them to do that works really well. <laughs> so all the cute little tricks that you learn. So on my palette, which I'll hold up here. I have white, ivory black, and then I've got a couple grays. These are very close in color. So I'll probably add some white to this guy up here. And um, you can, if you want it very loose, you can put linseed in there and you know make them very loose. I like them kind of um, not really tacky, but just flowing, I guess, not but not like sloppy flowing. <laughs> so I have to work on my words and descriptions, I think. But <laughs> I think, you know, when you use stuff like that, I had another um, art mentor that I dearly loved and um, he's no longer with us, but he was really funny with, with me with terminology. <laughs> he, would, he would tell me to blend something and I would say, which way? Do you want me to mushy blend it or do you want, want it just to be blended a little bit so that the there's a little slight color graduation? And he's just like looking at me going, just blend it. <laughs> so, but I always, um, vocabulary was always important. I guess it's because I'm a writer. So, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So I'm going to start with where I want my darkest dark. So. I'm gonna be quiet here for a second so that I can figure that out. Enjoying the video? Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when new Masters videos are added. I want the darkest dark as close to her as I can get it. And when I 
what I'm thinking is it's going to be right in this area. So you can see I have a smaller brush at this or a smaller palette knife at this point. And I'm basically want this darkest dark to come down and will be the main contrast with her hand and the sleeve, which will be in sunlight. I'll also put some um, under her foot, just so it's like a core shadow, just so she feels like she's grounded on that rock. So not very much there, but just a little bit. As you see, some folks would have picked up a brush to do that. I did it with the edge of the palette knife. Okay, so now I'm gonna to go to my next darkest color and that kind of gets put all over the place. So I'm looking for my little bit, there it is. So these areas down here on the side of the rock and I'm striving to just get as much, um, you know, it doesn't have, I guess sometimes it is that they don't have to be connected. There may be an area where um, I want it to be darker, so I'll spend another value and use that. And at this point, while I'm putting in these colors, I'm thinking about, you know, what color I might be mixing up in this particular area. And it'll be in the same value area, the same value that I'm putting down, but it may be cooler in temperature. Like this stone has a little bit of a indention here. So I'm kind of exaggerating that a little bit. And what I want to do when I go to color is maybe this is a purple shade, cooler, blue side of purple in here. And this is a bluer color. This is warmer in temperature. This will be cooler in temperature. So those kind of comments as I'm putting in or those kind of uh, little notes to myself I'm making when I'm filling in a particular value. What particular color will I be using? Um, what's the color scheme of my painting? Do I want it to be um, you know, do I want to, since there's a lot of green, do I want to make the warm colors on the red, yellow, orange side? Um, what colors do I want in those greens? Do I want some some of the greens to be, you know, warmer with a yellow green and, and um, the shadows being in a blue green? So all of those questions I'm like asking myself as I lay down just the value. So Linda, is your process to do this value study first and then you do another painting or do you go on top of this with the color? I go on top of this with the color. Okay. Oops, sorry, hit them. Hit the camera, not used to it being there. <laughs> okay, so you can see me like just jumping around as I put the the value down and like I'm working in the rocks right now. Um, there's a shadow area here, but from the way that I drew it on there, I know that that shadow area is um, foliage. So I may want to um, you know, change the value a little bit there. So that feels a little more airy. I haven't made that decision yet. So I'm just kind of talking and, and thinking about the rocks at this point. So this is a nice area where a color change will come in because it's two different rocks, but mm -hmm. the value is the same. So another way of thinking about this is simplicity. This really helps you simplify your painting. So if one of the things that you're finding that you're doing while you're doing this is um, like, let's say you start out in color and while you're starting out in color, all of a sudden you find yourself with 
you know, values all over the place. This is really simplifying it and allowing you to later just jump into that, that color process. But at the same time, while you're doing this, you're, you know, always, at least I'm always asking what color do I want this to be? What, you know, what would be the best um, use of color? What temperature is it in shadow? Another place where we can join some rocks together so that the eye moves with just the color change. Oop, didn't get enough color on my palette knife. The other neat thing about using palette knives is you never have to put a knife down or like your brush down to make a color. You can mix it on the on the canvas. Um, I'll put a little more here. So, how did you get to um, just painting or painting only with palette knives? Well, there's a story there. <laughs> I told you there's always a story. Yeah. <laughs> so I was studying with Kevin and I, I think Julie would probably say the same. Julie DeBoer would probably say the same about David. Um, but when a master sees that you've got talent, they're a lot harder on you. Or at least Kevin was with me. David may yeah. not be that way. Um, so it got to the point where I was like almost afraid to show Kevin my work. And drawing was a big problem <laughs> with me as well. And one of the things that Kevin suggested I do was, you know, that book, um, oh shoot, the right brain book about drawing. Yeah. 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 So I picked that up and I started doing it. Well, I'm directionally dysfunctional. My husband will tell you that I'm awful when it comes to telling him which way is north, which way is south, which way is east, which way is west. And I, west. And I think it's because my brain works just a different way. Um, with the, I, don't, I, I'm, I haven't really ever figured out <laughs> why that is, but I am. And once I got into that book, it it put a block. I couldn't do anything with a brush. So all that I kept getting was you know this mess. And then I was afraid, you know, like I, I worked through that particular block, but then I was afraid to actually let my brush have a lot of paint on it and a lot of texture to whatever I was painting. It was, I got really afraid. So one day um, I got really frustrated because I couldn't stop this block from happening. It didn't matter what I did. I just couldn't paint with a brush the way I wanted to paint. So I decided that um, I was going to pick up a palette knife and paint with that and see what Kevin would say. So I went a little bit too far with my dark there. So I'm just gonna come back and put some light here for this rock. And that takes me to edges, but let me finish the story first. So I picked up the palette brush and I, or my palette knife and I started painting with that. And I had all this wonderful, beautiful texture. My values were better. Everything was better. And I showed it to Kevin and he goes, wow, I don't know what you did, but whatever you did, keep doing it. And I said, I didn't paint with a brush. And he's hmm. like, what? <laughs> so went through this whole discussion about how that happened. And, um, you know, from that day on, Kevin was like, if I started out with a brush about halfway through, he would come up behind me and say, switch to your knives. And it's like, oh, so now I just got to the point where I can, you know, easily blend like I'm doing right here with the edge of the palette knife, those two colors. Which we got it, you know, we need to get to the point where we actually consider gray a color. It, it does so much in a painting. I'm gonna get a smaller knife in a few minutes. I'm gonna put some values on on her. So I'm gonna put the shadows in first for her. 
This is her hair, which is another lovely thing I liked about the painting is the way her hair was playing in the light. So part of her hair is in shadow. And I'm just teasing some of that darker value down here so that you'll get the feeling that her hair is not exactly standing still. It's one of those things that Bob Ross calls about as happy accidents. That's just what happened there. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Her back is very light, except for this one area of dark where I have her hair. Coming down a little bit of a ridge there I don't want. I'm going to come back. Put that one lock of hair in. So that will be a doorway to her other hair that's here, which with even within each of the um, shapes that you're putting in with your palette knife, you always want to figure out where your doorways are going to be, where the eye can go from one area to another. And you can tell what I'm laying down is very thick. It's not a thin coat at all. As you can see the texture that's coming in with it. So right under here are her dark blue tights that she's wearing. Oop, my painting just fell down. <laughs> That's right. And then her foot is also light. And I need to get her arm. That's really good. <laughs> Thanks, Darcy. Yeah. Can really see the person there. Yeah, and she's going to be, you know, that's what's going to catch people's eyes first. Yeah. yeah. There's a little bit of dark between the foot and the hand so that you can see the the difference of them. But, you know, when I was painting that, I wasn't thinking this is her foot, even though I was saying it to you guys. But that's, I mean, that is her foot. But I don't have all of the, you know, the exact proportions. I can cut it back later when I um, have the color that I want it to be. So you get, I mean, I, I'm, how, where are we on time, Darcy? Uh, it's 12.30. Okay. So I'm going to take uh, some of the lighter value here where I have the darker and just kind of throw that on so that you can see how that interacts with 
what I've already got down. You're making me want to uh, try oils and a palette knife. <laughs> oh, they're so luscious. They, I mean, and doing it with a palette knife is, to me, it's so freeing. I mean, some people may say, you know, I get the the same feeling with a brush and that's great. I don't have any problem with that. It was just didn't work that way with me. Mm -hmm. So. What do you paint in, Lorraine? Oh, acrylics with a brush. Okay. With a brush, yeah. You know, I've never done acrylics with um, a palette knife, but I assume that you could do the same thing. It's just, they need to be very wet. Yeah, and I would think you'd have to do your blending as you go. Right. Yeah. Um, if you hear a little thing that sounds like a baby crying, that's actually my cat. <laughs> he's got, <laughs> he's got a very high meow. Don't you buddy. Yeah. He's down here going, meow. What's going on? Okay, now. The watercolor value will be very, hold on a second, Harry. <laughs> He's, he got caught up in my st strings, my wires. <laughs> it started pulling me away from things. So I'm just putting in, this will be the same value, the watercolor. Now, you know, there'll be highlights that'll be involved with that and again you know the top of this rock is probably the same value or will be the same value as the water so i may leave just a little bit of white showing just as a mental note for me mm -hmm. that there's a different color shift happening there and sometimes within the water there are some deeper, darker pockets. So this is the fun part. This is where you get to, you can use actually a bigger knife and have some fun blending. So when you lay color on top, is your um, base still wet? Uh, sometimes, you... sometimes I just let it dry. Okay. Um, typically what happens is I have, like I told uh, said earlier, I have three paintings going. So what I'll do mm -hmm. is I'll get this all based in, and I can show you one of the other ones that has uh, totally a um, black and white done to it and, and how thick it is. I can show you that in a second. And, um, you know, that one is something that I'll end up working on as I'm working on this one. That's a really neat effect with the darker... Yeah. 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 And then there's this, what's really cool is when you use a, a thicker or larger knife like this and you pull down mm. and then come across, see how much more yeah. it feels like it's a part of it now. Yeah. And it feels like water now, like a reflective bit of water on it. Oop, that's not that color I wanted. I wanted the darker one because I want to put a dark spot right here for the side of this rock. So can I ask you a few questions about the mentorship group? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I know that in some of your more recent blogs that you focused on the importance of mentorship and speak to the differences between advice or training. Mm -hmm. Can you share a bit of what those differences are and how that will translate into the mentorship group that you will be facilitating? Yeah, a lot of times um, what I've seen happen, um, and I'm not saying that I've seen it happen with Mastrius, I've seen it happen in other uh, type of mentor groups, um, is that every once in a while, some folks will you get all of the attention. And I don't want that to happen in my group. I want um, to be able to help each person 
with what they're struggling with and understand maybe the block that they have mm-hmm. and um, work with them to get past that. And, it, you know, it may be something as simple as let's change your tool, whatever tool you're using, um, and use your finger to blend this area. Do, you know, something totally different that'll free you up. And uh, a lot of times I don't see a lot of mentors um, doing that. Um, I, you know, studying with Kevin, it was always very much, this is the way you do it. But whenever I would ask him, why is it, you know, why is it that you do it that way? What's the technical thing that you need that I'm not getting? And, you know, tell me what that is so that I can understand it technically. And I think that goes back to my Procter and Gamble training where I was a technician and I always had to have a technical reason why I was changing a test or, or inventing a new test. Um, So with me, what I want to be able to do is uh, tell folks, this is the reason why you're doing this. The color is perfect. The texture is perfect, but it doesn't belong there because it doesn't make sense in the painting. And this is why it doesn't make sense. There's a, to me, there has to be a foundation or and technical reason why I tell you to change something. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing is I will never ever. (laughs) And I, and I can't, my, my students that I teach in person, I never take their brush or palette knife from them because if I can't tell them what they're doing wrong, then maybe it's not wrong. So I don't know if that answered the question, Darcy, but no, it sure did. Yeah. Okay. It sure did. Yeah. Part of the mentorship group too is critiquing. Yes. um, Can you share a bit about your process for critiquing paintings? Yeah. So you have to understand where photos lie because a lot of the things that we're going to be doing is going to be under or over uh, the internet. So I will be looking at everybody's paintings with my monitor, which could be set up totally different than the person Mm -hmm. who is looking at it in their monitor. So we're going to have to develop a language that allows us to account for those differences um, in the monitor setup. So I may be saying, gee, that place over there looks like purple to me. And they may be looking at it in real life and said, no, I painted it blue. And then we're going to get in a whole discussion of what, you know, warm temperature blue, cold temperature blue. And it's going to be somewhat frustrating. But as long as you know, as long as you can, which I hope to teach folks is um, as long as you know how photographs lie versus seeing something in person, you'll be able to get over that and develop a language that everybody can work with and be comfortable with. So that's one of the things that we'll talk about. One of the the things that I always do is is turn my um, p- photographs into black and white because mm-hmm. you can get and you can feel a degree of value in there but you also take out the color. And when I start thinking about color and doing color, I take myself back out on a bicycle ride or walking through or hiking through. And in my mind, while I'm doing that hike, I'm remembering that specific color of green that won't look like that specific color of green in a photograph. So there's only so much a a photograph can do when it comes to that, I mean, it, it focuses, the focus of the lens is typically contrast and um, light, so, but, which is part of contrast. But, and then it, it ranges from that, that what time of day it is that he, they're taking the camera, the light that's available and streaming down, the, the lens is taking that information and then doing its little calculation of, you know, this is, this is where, um, I'll make this a cooler temperature blue and I'll make this a, you know, lighter temperature blue or, or I'll go into the yellow green. So you always, when you're looking at photographs, at least when I'm looking at photographs, what I'm doing is I'm always asking myself, is that truly the way it looks or is the, 
lens making some you know something weird out of this particular way that you know it, it's being seen so we'll talk about that with photographs in my mentor group um if you're a plain air painter you know we'll talk about how you chase the sun hmm. and things that you need to do um with that because i used to paint air paint paint um but then i became a complain air painter I complained too much. So Kevin told me to get back in the studio. <laughs> so, so I did because he was tired of me complaining. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I can't stop the sun from rotating. So <laughs> was not happy with that. It is so true though. You can take a photo of your painting and then an hour later, take it again. And it's quite different. The coloring. Yes. Of it and, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, we'll, one of the things that I always um, laugh at, and you can always tell where somebody is in their development, is have them ha look at um, the shadows that they're painting. And it's like everybody's afraid because somebody out there, some master artist out there said, shadows are blue. They're always blue, no matter what. On snow, they're blue. On green grass, they're blue. Um, in a studio still life, they're blue. <laughs> and they're not. If you squint your eyes, if you go outside on a sunny day and you look at where light's hitting something and where the shadow is, squint your eyes. And if you tell me they're blue, we're going to talk about really getting your eyes to, to see color. Um, they're not blue. If they're, there's... There's a blue green in that shadow of a tree on the ground and there's the green grass that's in that shadow, but it's not blue. Mm -hmm. It's cooler in temperature, but it doesn't have to be blue. Is there, you know, is there a red flower around that's bouncing reflective light into that shadow that now all of a sudden we got a little bit of red and blue going on. So maybe there's a cool purple that's in there that mm -hmm. will adjust your eye to start seeing um, and how you see. And how I see are totally, is totally different. And that's because of the rods and the cones that are in our eyes and how many, how they set up at birth and how they continue to see um, and how we begin to age, how that changes. There's a science behind a lot of, of the things that, that, you know, can be explained so that you're taking the, the that science with you and you're leaving that photograph behind. Like I said, once I get going on this, other than doing a value check in my mind, I know where I want a color change and where shadows hitting. So that's a rock that you're painting now, correct? Um, yeah. And it may change to be a little bit of a brush or a, a tree trunk or something later. But right now, I what I know what I want is this light against a dark value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because that pops her out. Yeah. But and this value is the same as this value. And it's the same as this value. And as I'm bringing it down, it's the same. But it may turn out being just a cooler temperature of of something that was in the light. Because see right here, this needs to be light. Right. Um, so I'm going to change it to a very, to a, a value lighter, which may not look like it on the screen. But in, in when I'm blending like that, it doesn't really look like it at all. But And I'm connecting the dark of her underside to this dark up here so that what happens is my eye just goes whoop and right down right down here and whoop right in there mm -hmm. and then she pops out so this is a rock here also and that's going to be a color change And there's bushes and stuff that, that happen over here that may be connecting light, catching light. 
So you can see I changed the direction okay. of where I'm putting things down. Yeah. To kind of give me that. And I'll want those to sit down. So I'm going to take a little value change there. Yeah, so I want to break up. At some point, I want to break up that, you know, all the rocks that are there and get some softness in. And the neat thing about doing value like this is if you don't like something, you can change it when you get to your color stage. And as long as you keep your value consistent, it'll work because mm -hmm. you're, you're making all the decisions as you're putting the this down. So I have a very dark area there. So the, the other um, focal point that you talked about was a dark area in the top. Back over yeah. here. Will yeah. that be the same value as kind of the low underneath what you've got underneath that rock, but not as dark as in front of the girl? So this, since I'm keeping it to four values, mm -hmm. the upper part of this will be that. And there are very much evergreens. So they're kind of spiky and at least here in North Carolina, they are. Yeah. <laughs> Rocky Mountains <laughs> doing that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there was, I think there was four that were over here, but I'm, I'm going to make it five just because odd numbers, you know how that, yeah. if you wanted to put four there, you can, not a big deal. It's just uh, odd numbers attract. It's interesting because now that you've done that, my eye goes from that girl right up there. Yep. Yeah. And it, it's even better because like I said, this is our darkest dark. So yeah. if I throw some more darkest darks in here, just kind of getting it at a, a real, you know, maybe there's no evergreen there. The nice pleasing shape where the two kind of can meld together. Okay. Very effective. Yeah. And again, I'm not thinking evergreen. I'm just thinking value at this point. Getting some light out of there. So Lorraine, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I want to make sure we give some space if you have questions. Did you have any questions or comments or? Well, no, I'm not really. I'm quite impressed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. Too. <laughs> well, you can do this too. I can teach you to do this. <laughs> okay, and then underneath that is the um, is water from the creek. Here, you can see I still have some of that dark value on my palette knife, but that's that's okay. Yeah. The value over here is going to definitely be lighter. So whatever is going on over here, maybe a rock, maybe dirt, um, but it'll be showing. lighter oh well that's good <laughs> sometimes i hold my brush so i hold my palette knife as light as you would hold a brush so sometimes it falls out of my hand like it just did and thank <laughs> goodness i had my painting apron on because it took the majority of that so i may put a rock here that's grabbing some light that may change it may become the water still depends on how many rocks I have around it, how I might want to, like, this is a rock here. So we have about 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm curious in the mentorship group, then, would this be uh, like some of the homework to do? Yeah. Yeah. 
And yeah, then we would, so we would start out taking color is so complicated. Yeah. Um, that if you don't understand your values, you're not going to understand color. So one of the things that we'll do is we will definitely all most of the time be focused on value for co and composition a lot um, in the beginning, because once you get those fundamentals down, you can create anything. And then we'll work on color with that. And, and we'll talk about, you know, making sure that you see, I'm moving the, what I consider the water around a little bit. Um, you know, what I consider we'll, we'll talk about um, color and then we'll also talk about how grays in your painting. And when I say grays, I don't mean grays like this. I mean, like a gray, a gray down green or a gray down purple or red, um, you know, how that will help you and guide the eye. Um, it, they're very, very subtle. Grays are very, very subtle in paintings, but they mean so much and they help with understanding and transporting the, the, the viewer to another place. And we'll talk about how those relationships change and um, how putting one gray red color next to one gray green color you can just change the whole how the two interact with one another. You may have thought that it was going to be a cool area, but you put those two subtle, very, very subtle reds and greens next to one another. And the next thing you know, they're taking on this warmth that um, you didn't expect. So, so I have a rock here. And then this water kind of sets it back there. And what I'm going to do for composition, S's are always a, a composition plus. So I'm going to put the water in a little bit of like an S configuration back here. And I'll go through all of the different uh, compositions in the great. in the mentorship and how you can combine them and what happens when you do and you know again you're always thinking about how you're going to direct the eye and there might be a bit of a waterfall here just a tiny one cascading over the rock i feel like bob ross talking like that <laughs> <laughs> which by the way i do like his paintings i'm not making fun of him i do oh, like his paintings nice. They had a purpose and they fit their purpose well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to come over here and put, you know, a couple more trees in. But that gives you the general idea of, you know, what we're doing. Well, that's great. I'm really excited about that. Yeah. And again, they can carry over this dark, dark is dark over here, can connect it. And again, it's another way to direct the eye over, back over to here, and then back down. So you put some more dark kind of in the yeah, top up, left. Right. Yeah. So it'll separate the, the foliage of the trees mm -hmm. from the rock that I have going on here. Um, this particular... tree trunk is a cylinder which is another thing we go back to very simple shapes when we start talking about this this stuff you know we don't think of it as a tree trunk it's a cylinder and lights hitting it on this side Since these are pine trees, you know, it may end up being that this is some orange color, orange and yellow color um, bark. Mm -hmm. And color wise, you know, that's what I'm thinking anyway. And, it, you know, that's another thing. How many times were we told in kindergarten that tree trunks are brown? Go out and mm -hmm. look at tree trunks. 
They're not brown. <laughs> no. No. They got some red to them. If they're, especially if they're evergreens or cedars or something like that. So you can see I used the three different values just in that one little spot to give it more of a round shape. And the and texture then, too. Yeah, and the texture too. Exactly. So I don't want, see, this is one of those areas with the, the trunk of the tree where, you know, our eye can catch it here and go boom right off, right? But if I take some nice foliage, And put that and there with it. The, yeah. And then I cut off this tree trunk, you know, and, and so you're not, you, you can jump between the two, but, you know, with color, I can then come back and direct the eye back into catching this dark brown and bringing you all back down here. Not worried too much about the edges of the painting itself. Um, mainly because, you know, I don't want them ever really getting to the outside. I never want them to leave my painting. A, a great person to study for that is Claude Monet with his lily, mm -hmm. lily pads and, and lily pond, because he does a magnificent job directing the eye. And that's one of the things that I'll actually teach. We'll go through a, a number of the studies, uh, master paintings, and we'll study them and talk about how they use edges and how they use color, how they use value. And one of the things I have is um, how to read a painting with Monet's, one of Monet's lily pads paintings. So mm -hmm. we'll go through that. And we'll talk about Soroya because he was a master at light, catching light and Fetchin is a master at edges. So we'll talk about him um, as well. We'll talk about Mary Cassatt and how she painted children because she has a very specific way of doing that. Hmm. Sounds very rich. Yeah. So we're we getting yeah. close to the end we of are. our- We are. Okay. We're a few minutes out. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just filling some stuff in at this point, okay. um, but I'll just stop and kind of leave it there. On the other side of her, there's one. So we did have this light here, which I want to bring down. And this particular rock on the other side of her is in shadow. So I'm gonna put a little darker color there. Well, I am definitely going to go try this. <laughs> there you I'm go. I'm gonna try with oil. <laughs> yeah. And it nice, but. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lorraine. Yeah. Um, there's still some spots left in Linda's group. So if you're interested, uh, please go to masterius.com and under uh, find your mentor and type in Linda's name. I'd also encourage you to Google her uh, her name, um, Linda Reisenberg Isler, because she has lots of wonderful treasures on her, uh, on her page. And then the mentorship group starts uh, Wednesday, February 28th at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So that would be 4 p.m. your time, I think. Yeah.